Hey everyone, Duke Nugget 3 d here with a re-review of my United States Richardson Flory and Cops, or RFK gas mask from 1918. Uh, I'm redoing this review because I feel like the original review was a bit lackluster in terms of quality and information. So, to get right into it, let's start off with the history. The Richardson Flory and Cops mask was probably the most produced mask the United States made during World War I, totaling at around over 3 million masks from its beginning of production in uh, February of 1918 to its end sometime after the November 11th armistice. Uh, the Richardson Florian Cops was named after its three designers, Ralph Richardson, who was the head manager of the gas defense plant in Long Island, New York, E.L. Flory, who we don't really know much about other than his correlation with the Chemical Warfare Service, and Waldemar Cops, who is arguably the more famous of the three, who was a uh, corset designer from Manhattan, New York, who pretty much just showed up to the United States military and said, hey, can I get a lofty position? I want to make gas masks, and they pretty much just let him in, so... That's that. And the RFK was an improvement over the older CE type gas mask or corrected English model gas mask uh, in that the RFK improved the face piece design to be more ergonomic and a bit wider uh, to allow um, deeper defogging pockets and uh, more uh, a range of contours to fit various faces. And the main thing uh, that changed from the CE type was the head harness, this being a six type I mean a six-point head harness rather than the older five-point used on the CE. Otherwise, all the hardware and materials were otherwise the same. There may have been some experimentation with different rubber blends, but otherwise it was pretty much the same materials. Uh, the RFK, as I said before, was the most produced mask of the war, totaling at around 3 million, whereas the CE-type box respirator was around 1.5 million produced. The Akron Tiso was around... 200,000 produced and the um, the COPS TSO was around 330,000 or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but something around there. Anyways, enough about the history. Uh, let's get on to the details of the kit itself. Starting with the haversack, since that's the most well-known piece of equipment for World War One era U.S. mask. It's a very simple design, just a rectangular canvas uh, or duck canvas uh, carrier with two uh, pockets on the inside. We'll get into those in a moment. It has a long, thick canvas webbing carry strap, which uh, at current in its current state is in the ready position worn on the chest and can be lengthened with the use of this hook and eyelet system to undo it and carry it at the side when the gas mask is not required to be at the ready. It also has a waxed cotton cord that would retain the carrier against the chest while in use. Um, the cord is fastened around two D-rings. Uh, these will change in shape depending on the manufacturer of the carriers. Some of these earlier ones will have the D-ring type ones and others will have a more rectangular shape to them, such as the one that came with my Akron Tiso. Uh, there isn't really much to see on the front. It's pretty blank. Uh, there usually would be some sort of user name or marking here. You, a lot of these World War One gas mask carriers got what's known as trench art, where the user would write their name, their unit, their rank, and sometimes a little bit a little bit of art representing their regiment or uh, whatever branch they were in. Uh, but more often than not, those are being faked nowadays. So that's the main thing you want to consider when buying a World War One gas mask is, am I buying it for the mask or am I buying it for the trench art? Because more often than not, the trench art is faked. So getting back onto the details of the carrier, it opens with two lift the dot flaps from the back. And this is the most irritating part of the carrier here, this flap. Because of the gussets on the corners here, which are reinforced with steel rivets, uh, this makes the opening slightly smaller than it ultimately should be, and you really have to sort of rip the mask out to get it on in time. And so I kind of believe that's one of the reasons that kind of leads to these masks getting degraded over time, is the fact that you have to literally abuse these things to get them out. And uh, not only that, but it's very cramped in here. It seems roomy, but the mask's all folded up inside of here is going to crush them quite a bit. Uh, so uh, on this side here, you can obviously see a large main pocket for the mask itself. Like I said, it seems roomy, but you're ultimately crushing the mask to fit it inside. On the opposite side, you can see, or hopefully you can see, the coiled wire spacer 
for the filter to rest on so it does not suck up the bottom of the filter, I mean the carrier fabric. And you can also see the internal divider which has two large grommets at the bottom of it. I'm not entirely sure the reason why this is, but they're there and it's noteworthy. And on the inside you have a serial stamp. This, I believe, contains the date of 1918, but I could be entirely wrong. Uh, and there are other serial stamps throughout the carrier, but they are too faded to read. Uh, there is another stamp here, a number four, indicating the size. So that leads me to believe this carrier is not original to my mask because the face piece on my RFK is a size three, which I believe is a medium. So the carrier is not entirely original, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Um, you have a repair and instruction card for the mask. This is pretty typical on all US masks that will come with instructions and a set of repair plasters in case the mask gets a hole in it. And I've also saved the original tape that came on the hose. I do not have the wire and tape on the hose currently just so I can have the mask disassembled for display and preservation purposes. Uh, I don't believe this instruction booklet is original to this kit either just because of the safety pin. I could be entirely wrong, but the safety pin was used with the CE type and British small box respirator type masks to adjust the fit of the mask by cinching up the top forehead strap and uh, sort of pinning it to a tighter position. But since this mask has two forehead straps, I don't believe this safety pin would have been an applicable accessory. So that's that. Um, also, an another thing to note is these um, issue cards that in, that you're supposed to write down the your personal information and how many hours the mask was worn with what type of gas. I've never actually seen one of these filled out, so if any of you have a World War One mask that has one of these cards filled out, please let me know because I've never actually seen one of those filled out, and it's very interesting. And they'll typically um, come in one of these little envelopes, and those little grommets on the side there are so that the entire card can be tied around the base of the hose uh, to the filter. Speaking of the filter, the filter for the RFK is the standard green type J filter. Um, and uh, mine originally came with a type H filter, which is the yellow one, and those are not original to these masks. The type H yellow filter would have been issued with the Akron Tiso, so all I had to do was just swap the filters. Um, but anyways, t pretty typical World War I filter. You got some markings on the top here, uh, 24... 8H, that's probably a serial number, and below that is a J indicating the filter type. And then below that you have a manufacturing stamp of Hero. The Hero Manufacturing Company was one of the two companies that were assembling masks during World War I, uh, the other being the gas defense plant in Long Island, New York that also made this mask. Um, but anyhow, the Hero Manufacturing Plant, like I said, it was one of the companies where various other companies producing individual parts for the masks would send all the parts to to have them assembled into the final product. However, the one part that Hero Manufacturing did make, other than just the entire mask assemblies, was the filters like these. So that's interesting enough. Uh, you got the straight shank for the mask to attach to on the top, and then below you have the opening where the inlet valve would go. I'll show that off in a second. You can see the charcoal behind the wire mesh and metal strip spacer so that there's an ample area for the inlet valve to have room to open and close. And I believe there would be some sort of marking right here, but it's too faded to read, so that's that. And here is a close-up of the inlet valve disassembled from the filter. The rubber valve is rock solid, and I'm not sure if I'm going to attempt to restore it. I may in the future, but yeah, it is currently rock solid. And you can get a good look at the markings that were originally on it, and then flipping it over, you can just see the pattern of where the air, air would come in, the shape of the valve seat and whatnot. Next up here, let's take off the hose since that is currently disassembled. And there are several different manufacturers for these hoses, much like any other part on these World War I masks. And I've seen two different patterns of these 10-inch uh, 22 corrugated hoses. Uh, one will be uh, in this style, where it is the actual rubber hose itself, and then it is wrapped with a single piece of stockinette fabric. And then the other one, which I have on my AT, it is basically the same rubber hose, except it is a single tubular piece of stock in it that is merely stretched over the length of the hose so that the seam will not be present on there. But that's kind of interesting how there's various ways of making the hoses depending on the manufacturer. And finally, let's get to the face piece itself here. So this is the main thing you all wanted to see. Um, as you can see, it is made out of a thin rubberized uh, cotton sailcloth material, which is uh, which has folds that are glued and then sewn in place with the when the uh, face seal periphery is sewn on. You can see remnants of the cement, the rubber cement that covered the seams originally. 
and you can just see how the harness is just sewn on there. There's no buckles, no adjustment. It was very simple back then. Whoever later masks like the Akron Tiso did have, uh, and in some variants of the CEM even had adjustment buckles, but adjustment buckles on World War One masks are kind of uncommon. You can see the markings above the nose clip where there is a size three indicating a size medium. There is a serial or a lot number right there. And then on the other side here, you got another lot number. Uh, not much to see there. You can get a close-up of the eyepieces, which are remarkably clear for their age. Uh, these are triplex lenses, which are two thin sheets of glass with a layer of celluloid plastic in between. And this was so that if the lens got shattered, it would not break all the way through and permit gas to leak. And more often than not, the celluloid layer is degraded on these lenses, and so it'll make the lenses look really uh, yellowed or blurry or even burnt up in most cases but on this on my example it's completely clear and visible so that's a very uncommon thing to see on these world war one masks uh, another thing here to note the eye pieces which are a pressed aluminum sort of flanged onto the face piece material these are a sort of an olive yellow color i don't know if the yellow was what they originally would have been but that's the way you see them most of the time anyway so i'm just going to call it an olive or a mustard yellow so that's kind of neat uh, you can get a close-up of the die-cast angle tube assembly, which would would let air in. The hose would attach to here, obviously. Let air in, and then when you want to exhale, there's a little bit of a dam inside of there so that any spit or salivation that may come back out through the mouthpiece would go out through the flutter valve here, which is a reproduction that I've made. I'm going to be making better reproduction flutter valves once I get the molds and the proper uh, materials in place. These were sort of made as a test batch, and you can check out my RFK restoration video if you want to see more details on that. But... You can see the flutter valve guard, which is made out of a stamped piece of steel to protect the valve itself. As far as I know, the RFK only used these thin types of flutter valve guards, where the CE type box respirator either had these thin type or the early clamp type, which were much wider. And you can see the steel screw and brass nut assemblies, which hold the steel lug in place on the angle tube. And there really isn't too much else to see externally, so... Let's uh, revert the harness. Actually, yeah, I'll show off the harness before I go to the inside of the mask. You can see the triangular head stitching pattern here for the head pad. And this pattern would be used well into World War II and after. So that's kind of interesting that this head harness design was not changed for well over 90 so years. And I say 90 so because the six point harness is pretty much a standard with US gas masks. Moving on to the inside, you can see that the rubber inside is in impeccable condition. It's super flexible, still very soft and supple. Um, you can see that the, the uh, eyepieces, how, how clear they are from the inside, and you can see how they were flanged in, where the eyepiece itself was rolled over an aluminum washer with a rubber gasket made out of the same face piece material in between. Uh, between the eye lenses, you have the nose clip, which would hold the nose shut so that the user would be forced to breathe through the mouthpiece. This was be this was noted to be a very uncomfortable thing to have to endure for several hours on end. Uh, you can below that you can also see the mouthpiece for the angle tube assembly, which is a bit warped, but it is totally flexible and intact, and uh, I'm very lucky to have it in that condition. So. I'm, I'm going to be making reproductions of these mouthpieces as well, but this will all come way later in the future. And you can also see how the angle tube is threaded on. There is a threaded aluminum nut which would correspond with the angle tube itself to hold it and sandwich the mask in between it. Um, it's uh, very difficult to disassemble these as kind of shown in my RFK restoration video, so keep that in mind if you're ever restoring one of these. Don't try and disassemble the angle tube if it's attached to the face piece. Also noting the the, the uh, eyepiece def uh, defogger pockets here, which would allow you to stick a finger inside the mask and wipe off the lenses with the face piece material. Uh, nothing much else to say about the interior there. So that being said, I will wrap up the video before my camera runs out of memory as it tends to do in these sort of moments. So uh, I am Duke Nuga 3 d I hope you all enjoyed. Be sure to uh, leave any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns down in the comment section below, and I will see you all later.